Okay, I won't backtrack because I've already said some of this in the opening summit plenary. But I, so what I was, where I was going with this is this kind of um, instinct that we have for connecting to place, which has been um, perhaps severed from us by the experience of globalization and certainly in the global north since industrialization, this kind of movement of people away from the land into the cities, this disconnect with, with nature. But I think one thing that bioregioning does is enable us to do that reconnecting. And just thinking about um, these huge systems, the predicament we find ourselves now of huge geosystems on the move. And sometimes I talk about it as Gaia on the move. But we have melting ice caps, we have the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation faltering, that's our Gulf Stream. We've got the jet stream, which is um, carry the winds that carry warmth and moisture around the world being distorted. We've got all sorts of uh, unpredictable and huge systems uh, interacting with each other in ways that we don't entirely understand and can't really predict. So in a time of that kind of precariety, that kind of um, perilousness, the feeling that we don't quite know what's going to happen. This move back to being reconnected with the land is part of what bioregioning is about. It's not all that bioregioning is about, it's only part of it. But one question we might ask in bioregions is how do we steward that land? And I think commoning has a lot to offer to teach us in how that land could be stewarded in common, in collaboration. So I won't say any more now because I'm going to come back at the very end and talk more specifically about South Devon. So I'm going to hand over to David now. Well, thank you, Isabel, and um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, I've, it's been so broadening for me just to be listening to everybody else uh, come at bioregionalism from their perspective. Uh, my remarks will be split into two general categories. One, a general overview of how commons can contribute to bioregional regeneration. And second, some more focused concrete strategies for move, moving forward. Now, what can commoning contribute to reclaiming bioregions? I think the first thing we need to acknowledge is the pervasiveness and the antisocial, anti-ecological nature of capitalist enclosure, which has privatized and marketized so much of our shared wealth from land and water and genes and seeds and civic infrastructure and you know creativity and information and it goes on and on where market logic and norms are the default way of meeting needs and they basically eradicated vernacular informal social systems uh, from subsistence to mutual aid to open source both in a literal sense of software, but open source as a methodology or cultural uh, model. And the good news is that I think in the past 10 or 15 years, there's been quite a resurgence of interest in the commons and commons discourse as a way of piercing the, the veil or piercing the, the normality of capitalist logic that has become so intense and pervasive. So really the challenge for our time, as I see it, is to how to recommonize a world has been captured uh, and being destroyed by capitalist modernity, um, meaning the culture of individualism, of technological progress, of capital accumulation, and in the Karl Polanyi sense, the markets as the principle for social organization of everything. Um, and of course the bioregion I think has a natural affinity intellectually, philosophically with the commons, because as Isabel pointed out, first of all, the human instinct for to be in a place and to be oriented and embedded in a place. And I think it's also the natural appropriately sized geography in which to recommonize. It's small enough to have interpersonal transactions and relationships with the landscape uh, but also it has the requisite diversity to be a robust, coherent uh, ecological system. So I think that I start from the, you know, obviously a premise that eco, um, that uh, bioregionalism and commons have a great affinity. And I'd like to try to sketch some of those 
affinities. I think, first of all, we need to clarify that commons are not simply unowned resources, and it's more a social system. And that's that means relationality lies at the heart of uh, commons and commoning, not these economistic categories of thought. So while we like to talk about the oceans or space or the internet as a commons, I really regard them as common pool resources or systems that are in need of commons governance, don't have it. Uh, nation states uh, may like to call themselves the stewards of the commons, but of course they have other priorities. So I think it helps to keep the relationality of commons and commoning at the core. And this is what will help us, um, I think, begin to have genuine relationships, not only with each other as communities, but with uh, earthly systems, uh, the, the non-human, the more than human, and how we can start to reinscribe the economy within nature, for, you know, along the lines of, of donut economics. Um, I think commons also have something to contribute because they're grounded in specific places, so they can help us develop a respect and deeper sense of a particular place in history and culture and traditions and social practices. I'm reminded of um, you know, Bruno Latour, the French philosopher who died recently in his book, Down to Earth, uh, I think had a great phrase where he said, we're suffering from an epistemological delirium as capitalist development narratives implode or no longer have credibility. But we don't have an alternative narrative for approaching things. And we don't have a grounding in place. We don't have a shared grand narrative to replace development narratives. And I think that commoning can help us develop that kind of coherent, new, necessary narrative and discourse. And it can help us develop a politics of belonging and place-based identity that really are marginalized or impossible within our current uh, capitalist liberal liberal market order, if you want to call it that. So what does this mean operationally on the ground? Uh, that's a question that my, my late collaborator Silke Helfrich and I tried to answer in our book, Free, Fair, and Alive, where we wanted to get at the micro level with the first stab at the meso and macro levels too, but focusing mostly at the cellular level of the personal, the social, the relational, you know, standard economics has the whole idea of homo economicus, the rational utility maximizing, blah, 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 as the avatar or, or ideal for what a human being is. We commoners didn't really quite have something like that. And we, Silk and I wanted to develop this idea of what does it mean to be a flourishing human being? And this, of course, is not just an economic issue, but a, a deep human condition issue. So we focused on the commons in this relational dimension uh, in which resources are obviously part of it, but you know, we, we immediately encountered the fact that language gets in our way and the, the word resource made us choke. And one word that we often use as a substitute is care wealth, the idea that we have relationships with these quote resources. And so starting to sketch these affective relationships that we have with uh, the nature, which itself tends to distance as something separate, as, as opposed to something immersive, was kind of our first order of business is sort of learning to escape some of the received vocabularies and to see how they subtly prevented us from seeing. So I won't go through, we developed what we call the triad of commoning to give a framework for talking about commons in which there's the social life dimension, a peer governance dimension, and a provisioning dimension. And each of them has patterns, which we saw in a cross-cultural trans-historical way of, in dozens of different commons, how certain shared behaviors and patterns emerge uh, irrespective of the resource, although of course resources do matter. Some are depletable and some aren't and so forth. But in general, it's about aligning individual and group dynamics, 
it's about taking holistic, the holistic scope of the situation while being mindful of individual needs as agents. So it's not simply this communitarian collectivism that overrides individuals. The term that we discovered was Ubuntu rationality. Ubuntu is the South African term for well, crudely translated, I am because we are, in which the I and the we are, we try to align. And so we tried to build on the Ostrom principles of commons, but then make them a more subjectivist first person perspective, as opposed to something looking outside of it from, say, a social science perspective. So in that world, our patterns speak to how responsibilities are connected to entitlements, how it's important to be fair-minded in allocations and, uh, of, and rules, participation is inclusive, uh, commoning and commerce have to be distinct. Uh, we have limits on market consumption. It's about needs and not wants. And in short, this was about building a parallel economy um, or in a term I recently discovered uh, in a, uh, I don't know if it was a speech or writing by Vaclav Havel, he talked about developing a parallel polis, which I think is a wonderful description of, he envisioned it as how we uh, deal with a totalitarian system of immense impersonal power. And he saw that the cooperative act actions of self-aware individuals was what helped create this parallel polis, which he saw as absolutely necessary to recover the conscience and agency of human humans and to give them to deploy that and make it consequential and not have us be utterly defensive. So he saw this as a profoundly existential, spiritual, human, moral necessity, as opposed to just simply how can we better manage uh, our shared resources or how can we amass collective wisdom or organize groups in a better way? So I do think it really cuts that deeply, in both in terms of what we need as alienated people within capitalist systems, but also in terms of the moral reclamation we need to do and the political strategy for asserting that. Uh, so that in kind of a nutshell is I think what I think commons can help bring to the discussion. There's obviously much more that could be said uh, from the history of the commons and different uh, theaters of action, you might say. But let me quickly, uh, how, how am I doing on time, Isabel? Do I have another few minutes here? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be quick, but uh, in terms of the unmet challenges for growing this vision, I think I'll just have like four or five different headings of action. One is people often say, well, how can we scale the commons? They're so small. And my response is that we don't want to scale in the sense of a centralized hierarchical directive that is managing things. The term that Silk and I developed was emulate and federate so that the appropriate scale being, can be kept, but you can federate horizontally and that's how you can still achieve greater impact, but it's not scaling in the industrial sense. Uh, we already see this with a lot of digital communities where they have transnational collaborations for open source software or Cosmo local production or open platforms or open access scholarly journals. So it's, it's not as if it's unprecedented and with the internet and indeed with conferences like this, I think we have the seeds for new types of trans local trans regional collaboration, which I think is a really important um, thing that we need to develop more. Um, how can we do this? Uh, I think the beyond uh, doing a lot of these things ourselves, which I think are vital to showing the leadership, um, some of them we may want to deal with the state. And this immediately opens a can of worms because it's a very tricky endeavor to deal with state power, which has had a long and cozy relationship with capitalist investors and corporations, enjoys the tax revenue that comes through growth, and is highly skeptical or uncomprehending about what the commons is all about. So having said that, I think that there still is room for exploring relationships, especially at the municipal and the town and city level uh, for commons uh, state relationships and partnerships. I think they should focus on things like building commons friendly infrastructures, 
so that uh, commenting can become easier, more normal, less heroic and aberrational. Uh, infrastructures that are not just serving the, the larger companies but are or, or market growth, but are serving open, non-discriminatory innovation by commenters, uh, which is maybe may have market dimensions that may not. So things from telecommunications to storage and mills for local agriculture to regional market spaces, regional cur alternative currencies, uh, place-based finance. Um, you could even have things like geographic indicators for regional specific products. There's many examples and there are uh, maybe in discussion, I can mention some of more of the examples, but Barcelona is obviously a leader in a lot of this, but there's cities like Graz, Austria, that has this exemplary information, digital leadership uh, in pro providing infrastructure. Uh, um, alternative currencies like the Berkshires, I'm associated with the Schumacher Center for New Economics. They recently launched a regional specific digital currency that can you can use with your phone uh, as opposed to a paper version has, has great potential for keeping money circulating regionally and multiplying quickly i think you all we also need hacks on the law uh, most western jurisprudence is very unfriendly to commenting because it privileges individual rights contracts pro property right and so market growth we need new forms that both authorize commenting in an affirmative sense and decriminalize commenting like say seed sharing so that it can happen you know the charter of the forest in 1215 or so arguably offered more legal protection to commenting than we have today which is kind of a sobering thought but i suppose not surprising given that we're in the belly of capitalism right now and then finally uh I think I, I'm developing the concept of, of relationalized finance, which is non-capitalist, non-extractive non finance that doesn't subordinate a project or a commons to state power or capital, which tends to use finance as a cudgel to force conformance with the capitalist norms. Um, and what I mean by relationalized finance is community embedded forms of finance as seen in land trust or CSA farms or alternative currencies or uh, crowdfunding and crowd equity in digital spaces. And the idea is to decommodify infrastructures and assure community control and try to uh, mutualize the ownership and management of the shared wealth without having the imperatives of growth, extraction, and the usual pathologies of financialization. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention and reference the Commons Public Partnerships. This is a frontier that needs to be developed, but there are some really interesting examples of how um, city governments are starting to work with commoners as opposed to simply saying, me, state, you, citizen. It's more of a collaborative, mutually supportive process in which the state realizes it can't do certain things. It has a trust and legitimacy problem why not work with commons to try to get things done with limited budgets, restore trust and legitimacy, and uh, in, a, in a way reconfigure state power, um, at least how it's exact, how it might be implemented, implemented beyond the usual conventional politician driven or bureaucracy controlled approach. So uh, I'll just leave those as provocations and we can circle back to them later with questions. So thank you. That was great, David, thank you very much. Then I'm gonna hand over to Christine in New Zealand. Good health everyone. Um, I want to go back in English history, but not as far as Isabel, back to 1794 when William Blake published his poem, London, which I'll read to you because it's relevant to the matter of colonialism and what we're talking about. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, 
every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. I was a big William Blake fan when I was a teenager and in my 20s um, because his songs of experience seemed to speak to me. And when I looked up the dating of that poem, um, 1794, and he's talking about the chartered streets of London, and I didn't know what chartered meant. And there's still some debate about it, but one interpretation is that it means the chartered corporations, which um, the first um, world famous colonial chartered corporation was the East India Company, which was formed in 1600 and went out. So colonialism happened first with corporations, uh, capitalist colonialism I'm talking about. I mean, there were states that would colonize places before then, um, but the the global capitalism and colonialism started then. And the East India Company, of course, literally went out and began to um, rob India. And then the state of England took over and governed the place. The Dutch East India Company was formed in 1602. And there's a sad story of the colonization of Indonesia and the other Dutch colonies, um, primarily for um, wealth to the shareholders. The interesting thing I think about Blake's poem is that nearly 200 years later, after those chartered corporations were formed, he is looking at London, the great center of England, and he's seeing on every face marks of weakness, marks of woe. And so the people in the colonizing country, the citizens of London, are not benefiting from this colonial enterprise. And we know the history of industrialization in England, which followed in, in, in the 18th century and, um, and on, uh, sorry, in, into the 19th century, and how that's been exported, that industrial model has been after World War II exported to the former colonies, which gained um, legal independence as development when in actual fact, we know it's incredibly destructive. And so I want us to think about how um, colonization and colonialism is ongoing. And just um, yesterday, I received a, an invitation to sign on to a, um, a manifesto for an eco-social energy transition from the peoples of the South, which is being circulated um, by Miriam Lang in Ecuador and, and John Pfeffer um, at the Institute for Policy Studies in the US. And they're talking about how the global north um, is actually um, doing another colonial grab on the south in terms of, for instance, mining lithium in South America for batteries for electric vehicles, which are supposedly going to um, you know, green up transport. Well, the majority of the people in the world um, don't own a car, you know, so it's just thinking about the extent to which, and the majority of the Londoners in Blake's day didn't own carriages and horses, you know, they had only their feet to get around on. And so although, um, according to Timothy Mitchell's book, Carbon Democracy, and also if you read Thomas Piketty's um, book on capital in the 21st century, there was this period in the middle of the 20th century, the 30 glorious years, as they're called in, in French, um, where there was this possibility to have a social democracy where the state undertook to improve the welfare of all the citizens. Um, but that then changed when, when neoliberalism came in because, you know, capitalists don't make money by doing that. And um, anyway, that's the, the, um, the framework within which I see the attempts today to do 
bioregionalism and which started off in the 1970s as a primarily ecological concept and commoning which is um, I think I'm just reading a book called Degrowth and Strategy which is looking at commoning because degrowth has got a lot of stuff about how we're not about doing the market and we're not about doing the state. We're about actually doing this community level um, commons process. And most of the examples that they give are of things like bike repair workshops and, and community gardens and things like that. And um, taking in, in the anarchist term, this autonomous space. And that can go as big as territories like the Zapatistas or the Rojava Kurds or whatever. Um, and, and yet, um, every place was somebody's place, as Isabel was talking about, that, um, that that territory in Southwest England has had multiple people living there and successions of people. And um, what we've seen in the last 500 years with the rise of capitalism is this global disruption. So the process of change that happened in Southwest England um, between Neanderthals and Bronze Age people was taking place over um, probably a thousand years at least. And um, for some people, I mean, New Zealand is the... Um, place in the world that was probably colonized most recently in the mid 19th century. So we, and whereas there's parts of the Americas which, um, and Asia, which go back much further. So we're looking at this disparate um, relationship to our place and to the people in the place and the way everything there is really mixed up. And I just keep coming up against these contradictions um, in New Zealand every day. For instance, um, one of the most recent ones was um, an Australian mining company uh, wanting to do a deal with um, a local hapu, that's a, a sub-tribe, um, to turn surplus power from a power station currently um, powering a foreign-owned aluminium smelter, New Zealand's only aluminium smelter, um, to turn it into green hydrogen, which would then be exported, <laughs> presumably. It's very odd. Um, and, but it seems like it's being um, used by big trucks somehow. They've worked out to, to, um, to, to run trucks on hydrogen in New Zealand. It doesn't make sense for private vehicles. So again, I just see this as uh, greenwashed colonialism, and this is what the people in the manifesto of uh, the energy manifesto from the um, global south are saying that um, these things that are going to make industrial capitalism keep going um, uh, in, in, in the people who've got, you know, who are living this Western lifestyle um, are actually stealing from them now. And this, it's in this context where, um, and yet we all know that, I mean, it's pretty darn obvious in New Zealand that the Maori people have been, you know, dispossessed of their lands and then dispossessed of their ability to make a living from their lands. And so one feels that, you know, as the descendant of the settlers, the colonists, who am I to say what deals they make? And I feel, and so the only way I can get my way through this is to say, we are living at a particularly chaotic time in global history because, and I just think this is so weird because I have actually lived through the peak of globalization, global capitalism, and I'm now on seeing the, the beginnings of the decline and this was predicted by the Limits to Growth study in the 1970s, and all subsequent work shows that their 50-year projection was correct. And <clears throat> we um, are starting to see that um, the whole, you know, the price of energy is going up, um, and that we are actually now, those of us who do not live in a 
a safe bioregion, as I'm fortunate to do, um, we're just going to be annoyed by it. But for some people, this is, you know, climate refugees, um, just terrible stuff happening. And so when I think about how we can bring together the bioregion and the commons, I think that we have to be looking at our specific histories and we have to be finding um, the cultural means that work for our particular society and that what works in England may not work in New Zealand just because there are such different histories. Commoning has um, a European history. Degrowth now is like a very European thing. There's lots that people in other parts of the world can learn from Europe. There's lots that Europe can learn from other parts of the world. And I feel that at this point in time, we're on this digital connection thing. I am not convinced that because this digital connection thing relies on energy. And the more difficult it becomes to provide that surplus energy, um, the more difficult that's going to be. So I just think that transition things away from high energy living are probably one of the most important things. And I was really inspired with um, John Thacker's presentation yesterday where he showed what was happening in the Camargue where they're actually seriously looking at what resources or what did you call them, David? Um, care wealth are available in, in that region that could actually sustain uh, people and it may be possible to have enough energy for um, digital things, or it may not. I just don't know. I see this playing out over centuries. So anyway, I don't have any answers. I just have a lot of questions. I just, but always I come back to, and it's partly because I've done political history, um, looking at what point in time we're in. And in um, David was talking about different vocabularies. And I think that one of the most interesting concepts that I've got from the indigenous people down at the bottom of the world, from Maori and from Aboriginal people, is that they have the same word for space and time. In Maori, it's takiwa. And I found this is the same for a lot of um, Native American languages, also for the Austronesian language group, which goes from Philippines right down through the Pacific. Um, and when you think about it, um, how do you know um, when you are if you don't know where you are and the other way around? And um, this is getting back to what David was saying about new vocabularies and effectively what Bruno Latour is saying, we need a new epistemology, um, but even bigger than that, maybe a cosmology. And I think that since the 60s, in the 1960s, people have been working on this. And we are at a point where we are, we've got lots of great ideas. We've got some projects around the world working, um, but we don't have at this point um, an historical agent um, as you know, under Marxism, the working class, we had a historical agent. Um, and I don't think that we ever will. Um, and so that is, and that, that wasn't such a great idea anyway, because it was based on industrial growth. Um, but how we operate and how we um, actually problematize what we're doing and make connections that are appropriate to our particular bioregion, that is a work in progress. So um, I'm really interested to hear what you've got to say now. Okay, well, thank you very much, Christine. So I'm just going to drop in a few thoughts about South Devon, which is a place where historically the commons and bioregioning come together. And just to kind of maybe just kind of help us think through what the potential is here. So i very interested to hear David mention the Charter of the Forest. So in 1204, because um, our king at that time, King John, had claimed the whole of the county of Devon as his hunting ground. There was a kind of revolt by the people of Devon 
and they got together and they collected a large sum of money and went to talk to King John and said, we want a charter of the forest. The forest being the hunting ground of the king. So the forest didn't actually mean lots and lots of trees on the land. Um, Devon didn't have an awful lot of trees, even on Dartmoor, it was quite denuded of trees. I, and King John granted them the charter. So this was the first charter of the forest, the 1204 charter of the forest, which then was adapted and expanded and was included in Magna Carta in 1225. So as many of you know, Magna Carta in many ways was kind of the, the formulation of democ democracy. And the Charge of the Forest is about the rights of common people on the commons. And, but as David has mentioned, the commons were always owned. The commons weren't a kind of free for all space. The commons talked about rights to be on that land. Every free man has a right to honey. Every free man has a right to pasture his pig on pigs on the commons in the forest. Where every free man has a right to fish from riverbanks or to collect wood for, for firewood or for repairs. So this kind of tension between um, learning, owning land and being able to um, collect dues on the land was even in the charge of the forest, it wasn't, um, it wasn't an ideal situation because it was always the, the common people who were petitioning for their rights and not to, be, um, not to be killed if they killed a stag, for instance. There was that kind of punitive sense of governing the commons. But anyway, to bring it further up to the present day, the commons survived on Dartmoor. In fact, there are many co named commons on Dartmoor, which are managed as commons and farmers on the moor rent their farms and they're able to pasture their, their sheep and their cows and their ponies on this land, which is not enclosed. So the sheep and the ponies wander everywhere, although they tend to stick in one place. And there's a commoners council that manages the commons. And the fact that it still exists today, I find uh, really is part of the um, cultural imagination of this place. So when we created the Donut for Devon, I don't think it was any accident that there was a real consciousness about the responsibility of people in Devon to protect or to steward local resources. So this idea of the global commons whether it's, it's fisheries or the health of the seas or the health of water, somewhere in the consciousness of Devon, there is this sort of historical sense that once upon a time, we restrained the power of the king. We gained back our um, ability to govern our own place and to keep it open and free, especially on Dartmoor. And that informed this sense of responsibility that we have towards these common pool resources, and we have a sense of how we might govern them. So going forward um, here in Devon, creating um, thresholds, allocations, indicators for these common pool resources, and the ability for ordinary people, civil society, to measure how they're doing is the direction that we're taking our donut work in and our bioregional work as well. So that's a kind of just mini, mini snapshot as to what's going on here. But also as a quick response to Christine, I, in the sense that it's always the victors who write the histories. I think it's kind of, it was the global North who articulated the commons. It didn't mean that the commons hasn't existed in the global South. It obviously existed in a different way, but there was perhaps nobody there to write about it in the way that happened in the global North or to create a vocabulary around it or to um, create a legal structure around it as well. So I think for me, it's, it's becoming more problematic, I think, to think of the commons as a colonial concept. I, and I'm always fascinated, of course, by the way in which the colonizers become the colonized, and the colonized become the colonizers. It's not, it's not like one nation has always been colonized or been a colonizer. It seems to go backwards and forwards the whole time. So we're in this constant process of kind of negotiating our relationship between power and land and resource. But with um, that, I, I think I, we should... Can I respond to that? Oh, sorry, yeah, please, else. yes, let's open our conversation with your response. Um, Go so, ahead. so um, you know, from 
to me, the question is, and the difference between what I see Indigenous people saying about their relationship with land and each other, and what I see the European tradition, which has had markets and states. And New Zealand is interesting because this is the last place where a market and a state were imposed on the original inhabitants. And their concepts, um, basically, the land does not belong to you. You belong to the land. And I, when I read Bruno Latour, and particularly his, his very last work, his After Lockdown one, mm -hmm. but also his face in Gaia, I think he was working his way towards saying that humans belong to the earth. And I see it as the earth bats last. Uh, so much damage has been done to the earth that now human life is becoming very difficult. And if we had stayed, and this is what Tyson Yunker Porter, the Australian Aboriginal thinker says, if we had stayed living the way his ancestors did for 50,000 years, the planet would not be um, you know, heating up and so on. And also human life would be better. And I take what they say very seriously. And I am now moving as much as I can to actually having the land tell me what to do rather than me thinking I can tell the land what to do, while still knowing that I will never have that relationship of ancestry with it for the people who are here originally. And so this to me is something which, and I know that Jan was talking before about her thing with the, the people of the Great Lakes, and maybe she could add something to how that's a different way of thinking. Um, and again, I've read, you know, Sherry Mitchell and Robin Wall Kimmerer, the Native American thinkers who also are really taking their steer from the land rather than. And so I, I think that even with the concept of commons, common property, um, as opposed to individual property, the whole property concept is something which um, in the Maori tradition, you had your territory, you had your rohi. Uh, but it wasn't, it was, uh, it was based on you doing the proper things in relationship with it and for it, um, which is so different from the stewardship concept as I see it. Anyway, Jan, maybe you could contribute something on that. Thanks. Yes. Um, um, it, it's an interesting aspect of understanding bioregionalism and then understanding the work of the commons and the over, as David said, over the last 15 years or so, how it's um, filled out a space that we have had taken over uh, completely by capitalism and, and then um, and then relating that from the models that have been maybe named initially in in Britain and Europe and then uh, other parts of the world, and then relating that to the first world indigenous people who are still here and have and have lived um, uh, close to their commons quite recently compared to other parts of the world, maybe. So, so the Great Lakes Commons um, gathering was in 2012 at Notre Dame University, and it was a bringing together um, with this sense of this big inqu inquiry. It's like, how does, how, like, what relevance does the theory of commons and the intentions and that how does that work with the understanding of the indigenous peoples um basically with the sense of how do we take care of the great lake like what would be what what aspect of weaving together both the history and the recognition of the damage that capitalism has done in separating us from the earth and from each other and having no agency um, regarding that. Uh, so colonization of, of both our, our, our minds and our, and our ways of being as well as the earth. And um, so a lot of storytelling and, and sense of what, what, is, what is the meaning there um, and, and the naming of the damage that's been done, hearing the stories of the damage to the people and hearing the stories of the damage to the lake. 
and kind of from that, then massaging together the intention and the vision of developing a social charter uh, of, of for governing the, the Great Lakes in, uh, in a different way than has been done. And that's really complicated because of the number of states and countries and cities and uh, various, um, whether it's fisheries or agriculture or uh, bottled water or like all the different industries that are in there. So, um, so I don't know if we reach clarity, but the process kept moving for a long time. I haven't been as involved in it lately, um, but the recognition of the need to step out of the systems that we're in was was that which compelled us all. And I think that's still where we're at in terms of all of this work. And I think having worked a lot in the commons and having worked a lot in bioregionalism, and then now I'm living in British Columbia working with um, indigenous people in this region, uh, it's still just how do we weave together our common concerns um, for the large aspect. I think as Isabel said at one point, we're all working towards Gaia and yet we come from our different stories of, of the pain and the challenges and also knowing that um, I have been coming from ancestry that's been colonized a lot longer than, than people that have been in, in indigenous here and yet the impact of that colonization has fallen differently. So just the sense of the sensitivity to the different stories, but keeping looking for some common um, vision of what we feel uh, could be done differently. I don't know if that answers it, but it speaks a bit to that specific um, gathering. Thank you for that. Jesse, you've got your hand up. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here today. I I, uh, I was an NGO rep uh, in the Commons cluster of, of NGOs at at the UN uh, at the beginning of the drafting of the SDGs, and uh, I I learned a whole lot about the UN. And 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 as a natural systems scientist, I also very closely observed the cultures as they intersected of of the the, the uh, the nations and the NGOs. The NGOs led led the uh, the drafting and and produced a rather ineffective world plan. And uh, I I think that maybe we should be more direct. That the Commons community might feel its re responsibility to to speak with the uh, the managers of the world economy who are mostly. Um, uh, good moms and dads uh, doing the work to protect their homes and families, um, but threatening the earth with exhaustion and collapse. Uh, the, the world economy already underway uh, uh, on the leading edges of it, at least in many people's opinions. And shouldn't we share with them our understanding that we have a common interest um, as as people living on Earth to have a, a a world system that survives and continues to serve us. Uh, anyway, that's that's been one of my issues for a, 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 a year or two now. Uh, approached in many other ways. That's what I'm doing now. Um, but what does anybody think about our responsibility to? Uh, care for the people causing the problem and help them see the need to change. Who would like to take that up? John, thank you. Yes, I'm well, I'm first thrilled to meet Jesse here for, for a start, but um, I think my position is I've had various attempts to have polite and open conversations with people who are in charge of large organizations. And the only conclusion I've come to is that, yes, of course, they're very often they're very kind human beings who do not wish to kill the planet uh, 
uh, on purpose, but that they they exist in context in which their incentive structures, their training, uh, their habituation, all lead them in an opposite direction. That somebody said earlier, we some of the older people here have all been around for the the steep. I think Christine said the steep bit of the the, the dreaded hockey stick chart when everything goes off the charts upwards. Everybody running the world and running the organizations and running government has only known effortless growth since the day they were born. They can't, uh -huh. they have no embodied experience of an alternative. And therefore, uh -huh. I don't think any amount of, you can talk to them kindly or unkindly, or you can shout or you can wave a, uh, you know, a pitchfork at them, but they are in a, a, a mental and a kind of historical and a cultural condition, which does, I think it more or less makes it impossible for them to voluntarily switch. But the other thing uh, which I've learned, learned from Jesse is that they're not, it's not about people making choices. We're in a, a biophysical kind of evolution of a, a world systems that is not capable of being turned around by people changing their minds. It's not about people have, making decisions. It's about how energy flows in the world have been evolving. And I personally think you're just going to have to buckle up and uh, yeah, experience the consequences as best we can. If I can riff on well, John. Uh, if I could just respond very quickly, that was definitely true 20 years ago and 10 years ago. Less true now. There are a lot of people in the financial system really upset with where it's going. And it will be less true in 10 years. And at, at what point do we try to help them um, turn turn their view to how they could rearrange to care for the system we grew rather than exploit it ever more grandly. So that's all I have to say, thanks. I, I would just riff on both of those by saying, I've come to the conclusion that while we obviously have to engage with the state, obviously have to engage with finance and business and so forth, that one of the most powerful strategic alternatives is as Vaclav Havel was pointing out, is to build a parallel system that is functional and works, much as open source software did, much as the local food movement did, which itself as a functional alternative acts as a moral indictment, as well as a functional alternative that people can grow into. And I find that that's um, not only maybe attractive, but maybe necessary given how corrupted and locked up many polities are or simply authoritarian. So that's why I have been focusing a lot of my energy in developing horizontal networks of commoners to build their own parallel system and uh, inter deal with policy, state, and the law as necessary, uh, but otherwise don't depend upon them. So I, that's my take on, on that. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. Um, but the the balance is tipping. I'm going to turn Can to I Marianne. change to another subject. Marianne, come in. Um, so David, I, I sorry I missed the beginning of your presentation. So I'm sorry if, if it's questions these questions are repetitive, but in terms of you know thinking about growing commons, um, I immediately go to thinking about the tragedy of the commons and, and some of the challenges about. Um, a, a metric that really are relevant to the, the state of the commons, like, like the fishing out of Atlantic cod, you know, when local fishermen didn't really, there wasn't a really good measure. And when the EPA came in and told family fishermen like, oh, wait, you're, you know, you're fishing fish that haven't reproduced yet, that then there was a sort of kill the messenger. So there, you know, there wasn't really a good storytelling or I also see, you know, some storytelling to really hold a bigger context that can inspire people into it. But also I see the positive effect of community shame. You know, that, the, you know, that I, I also have been involved with a housing co-op in New York and they talked about how, you know, they really filtered who they let into that co-op so they wouldn't sell out to the pressures of the capitalist market and how there was a kind of powerful community shame if somebody was considering going that way. So I wonder if you could kind of speak to, 
you know, the things that lead to sort of the tragedy of the commons and trying to hold the commons together? Well, first of all, I take issue with the whole tragedy analysis because it presumes a whole different, uh, first of all, it assume it's a free, he was describing a free for all with no community rules, no punishment for transgressors and so forth. So he was describing a libertarian economistic free for all. And so I reject his, I think he wasn't describing a real commons the way Eleanor Ostrom was. So once you move into the, the commons as a social system and space, there's, there are all sorts of collective social pressures, including shame, but uh, a lot of it is, as Ostrom herself said, graduated sanctions, meaning the social community tries to work it out through negotiation to maintain the relationship and not simply uh, eject somebody from it. So once you get into the social system, you also get people stepping up to responsibility and entitlement and having a stake in the game instead of outside bureaucrats or somebody that they don't have a legitimate relationship to. They're, instead of them imposing rules, the community itself develops the rules. And you know, there's been studies of local fish, coastal fishermen or lobstermen who in classic form, self-organized rules that make sense to them, make sense to that geography, and they work. But it's just that states tend to want one size fits all top-down bureaucratic control, which, you know, so that's why I think different types of engagement by the state to empower commoners to be commoners, or let's say empower fishermen or other players who are not currently commoners to learn how to be commoners is something that needs to be explored more because otherwise you get the resentment of the Bundy brothers in taking over public land in the Western US because uh, they didn't have control and Washington was dictating. So those are a few thoughts on your points. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, David. So I'm just gonna drop in um, an observation here, which is here in South Devon, we do have a kind of, um, shell fishery commons that exists across the channel. So it's the only informal um, alliance between shell fishers in, on the south coast of England and shell fishers in France, the Netherlands and Belgium. And they meet up every year in a bar somewhere and they negotiate where they're going to put their pots and when. I, but they do ask, it, the common, that commons only works if it's protected by the state. So unless they're able to call on the power of the state to stop these kind of huge bottom trawling boats coming in, those agreements don't work. So clearly the commons in that particular instance and the state need to work together. Um, I'm going to move on to Killian, but other people might want to kind of ponder on that and come back on that particular point. So Killian, what's your question? I have completely lost what I was going to say because other things have come up in between and I was foolish enough to not write it down. Um, so, so I will say <laughs> other things. <laughs> um, I, I think just in general, I, 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 I want to make just a couple of general points, I guess, because I totally forgot what I was going to say. Um, and one is, is that I try to look to where commons currently exist rather than read what somebody else has to say about it, right? I look at what commons already exist and I look at their characteristics, whether, which I've shared several times. I can share it here if anyone wants me to. My, my list, it's a list that I developed of what a, a uh, regenerative society is, which is basically the same thing as a commons. Oh, and I think that was my point actually, that I, I, can't, I have a very hard time separating the concept of the commons. And I said this in the chat, I think the commons from the human and the physical, they are there. There's no way to separate those two. And so I somewhat disagree with you, David, um, that we can define the commons as a social enterprise because there is a physical aspect to it. There is a there are boundaries that function in nature and it is the combination of the functioning of nature that is designed a certain way, which we help design. Mind you, we co-created those functions with nature over the last 85,000 years, at least, if not longer. That's what we can scientifically identify so far. And so we, we have created, co-created that. And I have a very hard time. So I do believe that commons already exist. They do exist. And we simply are trying to rediscover them. 
and fit back into them and figure out how to do that. And we have, yes, altered the earth so drastically that we're going to have to sort of redraw the lines in some places. In other places, they're barely still intact. But, um, you know, if we are wise enough and creative enough, we can get back to it. But I don't think these are separable. The I, physical I commons and the, and the, and the human uh, monitoring, managing part of the commons is one and the same thing. And that's what we see in indigenous cultures. And, and so a simple point that we, we talk about in permaculture that comes from indigenous knowledge is you never impose design. You let it emerge, which speaks exactly to this because nature does tell you what to do. And someone else said this earlier, I think in the room, um, nature does show you what to do. And then you have to combine that with your creativity, your needs and the needs base and what nature can provide. And you put them together. It is one and the same thing for me. I suggest that I don't know that that makes sense to anybody else, but that's how I see it. And I have a very hard time seeing it any other way. Uh, I, just, I don't just to share that, I guess. I don't disagree. And I think you're absolutely right. But it's nonetheless, it's not about social management in the economistic sense. It's about the social integration with natural systems, which I think, you know, eco philosopher Andreas Weber makes a great case that natural systems are themselves commons in the sense that they don't have property rights or financial transactions or whatever, but they are deeply symbiotic and auto generative. And I think that that's part of life itself, of which humans are part. So we in the West are sort of having to come to that as opposed to being born with it as indigenous people. And it's our rediscovery and challenges Western moderns to, to uh, rediscover our deep relationality. Mm, thank you. David, and then we'll take a question in the chat. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm enjoying this very much and uh, missed much of the conference, but I'm glad to have connected today. Thank you. Uh, I'm working on some projects that I think are relevant to a number of points that have been made, and I want to ask a question of participants, uh, what makes sense in this, and historical examples that may be relevant or current initiatives. Um, basically, uh, I'll just frame this as uh, bioregionalism and the commons both assume, assume uh, a geographic base for human function. That may be village or bioregion, it may be neighborhoods or otherwise. And the question of how to engage the state means among other things engaging the geography of the state. Um, which in the United States and most places is a, an electoral franchise that's grounded in a geographic identity. I vote in my precinct. I do not vote on the internet. Um, and so for bioregional governance, uh, there's a challenge of where does that locality of the geography of the state's political system and the governance system of the, of the commons intersect? Many of the projects I'm working on now are, uh, look at this question of, uh, we're working with the Environmental Educators Association, EPA and others, of how can neighborhoods and these small precinct level uh, organization uh, at the cultural level and local commons agreements also engage politically, uh, whether that's a neighborhood assembly or in the municipal libertarian municipal tradition of municipal assemblies or otherwise. Uh, but I've found very few places where bioregional governance proposals or eco-village governance proposals or similar have actually engaged with the local geography, the political geography of their communities and the engagement of the state directly. As opposed to what I think was, was great, appeals to those actors who are engaging in global SDG or other sorts of policy engagement. But for most people, as someone pointed out, uh, engaging with Ostrom's models or otherwise and finding a local language that will both address the politics and their agreements amongst each other is lacking. There's not the language, there aren't examples, and those are perceived of as discrete. So beyond parallel governance initiatives, that can, the question of connection and of developing a majoritarian capacity for influencing policy at the local level from the bioregional organization is critical. 
I know of a few examples. I'm curious how people regard this question, and I'd welcome historic or current initiatives that reflect uh, the sort of question I'm raising. Thank you. I, th I think it's a great point of how to communicate this with the public. It's been something I've wrestled with in numerous iterations over the years. Uh, I'll give a plug for my recent book, which is my attempt to deal with that using the whole earth catalog as a format, the whole commons catalog, you might say, I call it the commoners catalog for change making, but we do need different vehicles for communicating with different groups of people. And it's not gonna be a single set of messages. You know, I know some digital people who are doing videos on the commons for the digital crypto crowd. And yes, there are commoners among the crypto crowd. Um, so I think this is a frontier that we need to address more directly, directly to get it out of the social, the dense social science of Ostrom into more popular vernaculars and examples and stories uh, that ordinary people, my mother can understand. And so I totally resonate with that question. Thanks, David. Isabel Tisson. Hi, um, I have a question for David as well. Um, you mentioned earlier that municipalities could be great partners um, for commons and in commoning. And you said that you might know some examples or further resources that you could share on that. So I'd yeah, like to ask you for those. Well, I'll just tick off a few. Um, Barcelona is probably the biggest case study in terms of an activist mayor and movement innovating in all sorts of way in terms of city partnerships with genuine commons projects. Uh, Amsterdam is seriously exploring it and politically oriented towards the commons. In Italy, there was something called the Bologna Regulation for the Care and Regeneration of Urban Commons, which, is, which was an early initiative to remake city bureaucracies to work as partners with neighborhood groups and citizen groups. That sort of has evolved in something called the co-cities movement. Uh, people like Sheila Foster in the US, I think at Georgetown and Christian Yayoni, uh, an Italian lawyer are involved in that. And then there's other irregular initiatives uh, such as, uh, well, I mentioned Cosmo Local Production, which is open source design and knowledge in which there's local production. Uh, places like Barcelona have a lot of fab labs that do that. And um, there's other localities that are trying to do local production based on global design. So I guess those are, it's kind of a, a totally potpourri under theorized zone, but there's a lot of urban commons experiments going on. Thanks a lot. Um, is there any, you said there's little, but is there any kind of literature or analysis of how like, local government specifically can and sh can support commons and or doesn't <laughs> it, it that's a tricky question in the sense that it, uh, it implies that there's a settled understanding of what commons is and what fits into the frame of that question when in fact there's a lot of higgledy piggledy different approaches yes there's a literature some of it i find arcane and bizarre some of it like really interesting but that's me. So I think just nose around in some of the academic literature. I find that really the practitioners are carrying more of the weight than the academics who are coming in late to the game generally. So, you know, check out shareable.net, the website, which has been into so-called sharing cities. Uh, that's their angle into it. Uh, check out the lab, labgov which is this inter-institutional network of laboratories for the governance of the commons that are city-based. That's part of the co-cities thing with Sheila Foster. Um, and you'll quickly radiate out into other examples. Thanks a lot. And Michelle Bowen's P2P website has a lot of this material on it. So you can get a lot of links mm -hmm. that you can follow from that. William. Well, I was going to follow up on something that Killian had said earlier. Um, he'd suggested asking Indigenous people about stuff, and I believe there are a couple of folks in this conversation who identify as Indigenous. 
And I, um, I've, I've heard their voices in smaller gatherings, not necessarily in bigger ones like this one. I just wanted to, you know, maybe pause and invite, uh, invite conversation uh, or ask if they were wanting to weigh in. He's back. No pressure, by the way, if you don't want to weigh in, don't weigh in, but I just wanted to, to make that invitation, you know, make that a spoken invitation. Thank you for that. Melina, is there anything you want to say about working with Indigenous people in Colombia? Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, something that I was trying to tap into is that, yeah, Indigenous people have been uh, the traditional knowledge of the commons, but uh, they had been fighting for those commons and for their rights on those commons for centuries. And uh, what it is uh, raw now, like really um, strange is that, that they have been kind of gaining the rights or like constitutionally or in the like, governmentally. But the Metis, the the, the, and the forces from the, econo the economic forces of globalization are still so hard that there, there is like this tension between survival and, uh, and, uh, and being able to evolve towards uh, communality in general. And, and that, that makes the environment really, really hard to navigate. So I just wanted to to know if there were more uh, or other experiences uh, um, on, you know, in, in, in the global south about this Metis kind of dialogue on common in. And um, yeah, that's it. I see your hand up, Killian, but I'm wondering if anyone else wants to come in here who hasn't yet spoken. Clement, we'd love to hear from you. Go ahead, unmute yourself. Hi, um, yeah, speaking from the indigenous Guan tribe in Ghana. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a bit difficult for me to know what the term commons mean. <laughs> um, um, but um, having um, come from there with the possibilities now to connect to the external world, what I know is um, there's a huge disconnect um, in terms of um, infrastructure connection. Um, the, the few people that um, have the possibility to experience the Western lifestyle kind of find it difficult to reintegrate into our system. Uh, the local system, because um, largely a lot of people, because of economic and um, speedy growth of a lot of the society, um, we are losing uh, grip of the indigenous um, activities and indigenous knowledge, because everybody, or at least from my side, the Guan tribe, majority of the people want to go to the Western way of living and thereby abandoning the, the indigenous knowledge. And even for me, I think I shared it on a smaller group before, every time I tell them our way is the way, you know, when I listen to all the regenerative knowledge and this, all that, I tell, going back to tell them our way is the way to go. And then they tell me, yeah, because you have it comfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, they see a lot of, in the Western world, there is, a, is some sort of ideal um, kind of environment or the best thing, way to go. Whereas when I listen to all the regenerative knowledge and agriculture and everything, I think we have been on the right path all along. Uh, and so it's difficult um, 
trying to convince them that let's go back to our old ways because they they don't they are all in the mode of going the western way you know um when it comes to food production why don't we do monoculture because it's it's easier it's but it's also difficult because how do i prove to them that um for instance um we have some parts of our land that contains um gold that contains um iron and the, some of our chiefs want to release these lands to the government or private developers. And uh, I am the one saying, no, we can't do that. And they they see me to be crazy. <laughs> they see me to be crazy because I have seen the few chiefs that have been able to sell some of their lands to private developers um, the lands are totally destroyed. Everything is, yeah, everything is is gone, and there's not even enough land anymore for them to 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 to, to grow food. But on the other hand, if I am blocking, I mean, I'm a, I'm a chief as well, so I bit have a bit of a, a kind of authority to block some of these activities, but it's difficult especially when it's not within your jurisdiction to stop one chief um, from exploiting the natural resources because they want to build a house or have a better life or yeah and we if you want to stop if you want to prevent it you must have to give them a better reason including an economic incentive to prevent them from selling out their land to private developers. So we have, so, I mean, last few weeks, we have like um, a chieftaincy um, uh, association where we bring all the chiefs together and are currently leading this process to do this, but it is very difficult when we are not able to get the economic basis to to tell them not to destroy their land, not to um, sell their heritage and their culture. Um, you know, it's difficult. So I, I, I'm listening to all the other conversations and trying to find ways where maybe I can find a common ground to communicate with some of the other chiefs. Um, but unfortunately, I seem to be in the wrong position because right now I'm in the Netherlands and my wife is from the Netherlands. So every time I speak, their mind is, oh, you have it comfortable. So to hell, to hell with you. And um, yeah, but... Yeah, I, I, I'm also searching for solutions. So, um, yeah, if you have some way that we can uh, collaborate to connect with some of these other chiefs, uh, I'm open to the ideas to 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 this. Clement, thank you very much. That was very powerful. I am sure there are people here in the summit who'd be happy to connect with you and help you think this one through, but I, I don't know if it makes any difference in your um, conversations with the other chiefs to know that people in the global north are also trying to figure this out and actually kind of looping all the way back again, around back again to the way you traditionally do manage your land. I don't know if that would have any weight at all with the chiefs that you talk to. Yes, definitely. I mean, if, uh, if you know that there is a larger uh, group of people also focusing on going back to our previous knowledge. I think definitely it will help. And of course, um, it is that's not more just my voice, because right now it feels like uh, you seem to have been able to get access to the international world. So you don't want us to get there. 
<laughs> but if you bring in more people that say it's like your way is the key, mm -hmm. and then also maybe find some alternative solutions besides just telling them, but bringing some economical possibilities also to them, maybe that 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 can help to salvage the situation. Yeah, okay, that's good to hear. So we have got to the end of this session, sadly. Um, I just wanted to ask Christine and David if they wanted to say a, some brief closing words to round this conversation up. Um, I, I would like to respond to, to Clement um, and just say that obviously African examples of people behaving differently are what you need in your situation and wondering whether you are aware of earth jurisprudence Africa. Does, have you heard of that? No. Um, so if I can, um, we, if we can connect after this, um, yes, it's just sure. that I'm connected with some people and there is um, that movement which has got people from all over Africa which are looking at this a more bioregional approach and a more traditional approach as a Kenyan guy and um, others that are somebody from Benin so it's really showing that um, it's not trying to imitate what's come from the west it's actually taking the best of what is in Africa and the best of what is in Africa is awesome and I think that's the only way that, um, you know, it has to come from within your place. And really, that's my final comment to the everybody that um, we're all coming from different places. I've been having a chat with Dora in Hungary about, you know, and she lives in an apartment block. Um, there's hardly any apartment blocks where I live. All our places are so different and we have to work out the ways that are going to work for our particular place and make a commitment to it. And I think to me, that's the biggest thing. You make a commitment to your place and its people, and then you work with them and the place for what is possible there. Yeah, well said. I, I would just like to end on the note by saying more explicitly that there is a pluriverse of commons around the world because naturally all of them conform to their local geographies and, and places. And so they will naturally have different modalities of how they work. That said, there are certain recurrent patterns and I'd like to use the word patterns rather than principles or blueprint or something uh, inspired by um, Christopher Alexander and his, and his pattern languages methodology, which is social behaviors that emerge and recur to same similar problems. So I just wanted to sort of validate the sense that we can all have different senses of the commons based on where we are at or the particular commons we're in, while there are certain generic similarities that guide it in terms of keeping wealth inalienable, managing it for the members of the commons and, and so forth. And I think the South does have a different challenge both because they have their history and traditions that are more rooted if disrupted by global capitalism. But the, I think the truth is we're all dealing within a global capitalism and find, trying to find ways beyond it, or at least to carve out some social control and, and morality uh, that it's destroying. So I think there's a, really a rich potential for a, a North-South dialogue in which there's shared interest, albeit different circumstances we're, we're uh, dealing with, and the commons as a discourse or a language can facilitate that with hopefully not dictating or claiming to be over, overly prescribing, overly specified. So I'm just thrilled that we can have this conversation and uh, you know, it, it is an ongoing conversation. It's not as if there is an answer. So this is part of it. Yeah, okay. well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christine and David, for being part of it. And this definitely is a conversation that's going to keep running. And I can see from the conversations in the chat that there's lots of potential for bringing many people together to keep this going. And as part of what the summit team would like to keep doing as well. So I'm going to stop the recording. As Melina says, there's a hangout now. So if you want to keep on conversing about this, you can join Melina's Hangout. I also think you can just stay in this room. I'm not sure 
Melina, there's anything else programmed in the main room after this? The hangout is in the main room. It's in the main room. Okay, well, it's a seamless dovetail then. The transition across to Melina. I'm going to hand yes. it to you. <laughs> Thank you. I think you kind of stopped the recording. It stopped the recording. Ah, oh. I thought I had stopped it. I am not a host if you want me to do this.